Good morning. It is such uh, a pleasure for me <coughs> to see so many of you here physically <coughs> to join us in this worship service. We are working and praying very hard for the church to open more so that all can return to physical worship. <coughs> so <coughs> if I can just add a word of welcome to what the worship leader has said, welcome and good morning. And mm. <coughs> good to see some people that we have not seen for two years. <laughs> welcome back. You know, my assignment today is simply to speak with you on the topic do not waver do not waver between yes and no <clears throat> taken from uh, verse 12 to verse 24 of Paul's letter uh, to the church at Corinth uh, that the church calls second Corinthians second Corinthians <clears throat> uh, as some of you may know, we are continuing our series of studies through the book of uh, First and Second Corinthians. Now we are second week into the study of Second Corinthians. Uh, but Second Corinthians is a very, very personal letter. A very personal letter, unlike uh, Paul's other letters, which are, you know, theological and didactic. Didactic means to teach particularly moral instructions or principles. So unlike his other letters, Second Corinthians is very personal. <clears throat> so the topic itself, you know, do not waver between yes and no, carries with it a sense of practicality. Saying yes or saying no, doing something or not doing something. So because of this, uh, the, because of this personal uh, uh, and particular nature, a practical nature, I will follow the cue and be very, very simple and uh, practical with this sermon today. <clears throat> so I invite you, if you have your Bibles uh, or your devices, to turn to Second Corinthians, uh, and I will read chap uh, verses 12 of chapter 1 right to the end. Uh, uh, right to verse 24 of chapter 2. But uh, if you like, just follow it along. I will, today, I've chosen to read to you the version that we call New Living Translation. New Living Translation is a very, uh, is a new translation. It's written in very simple English, uh, easy to understand. And by just following along the reading, you will have already got the sermon. So it saves me a lot of work. So let's turn our Bibles <coughs> uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll read from verse, 20, uh, verse 12 onwards. It says, we can say with confidence. When Paul says, when Paul wrote here, we, he means to say, he means to refer to himself, refers to Timothy, Maybe Titus was with him as well, and uh, Silas. So he said, we can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. That is how we have conducted ourselves before the world and especially toward you. Verse 13, our letters have been straightforward <clears throat> and there is nothing written between the lines and nothing you can't understand. I hope someday you will fully understand us, even if you don't understand us now. Then on the day when the Lord Jesus returns, you will be proud of us in the same way we are proud of you. Verse 15, Since I was so sure of your understanding and trust, I wanted to give you a double blessing by visiting you twice. First, on my way to Macedonia, and again when I return from Macedonia, then you can send me off on my way to Judea. 
You may be asking why I changed my plan. Do you think I make my plans carelessly? Do you think I am like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy and I preach to you and as God's ultimate yes. He always does what he says. <clears throat> Verse 20, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised. Verse 23, now I call upon God as my witness <clears throat> that I am telling the truth. The reason I don't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. But that does not mean we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so that you will be full of joy for it is by your own faith that you stand firm. This is the word of God. Come, please join me uh, in praying uh, to seek God's wisdom. Father, as we come to attend to your word, we pray, Lord, that your spirit will open up your word for us. And what we know not, teach us. And what we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us for Jesus' sake. Amen. First, <clears throat> before we go on, let me do a very, very quick recap of what was taught last week. Just in case you are not here. Last week, Pastor Daniel led us off uh, in our study of Second Corinthians when he preached from verses 1 to 11 of chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 11, on comfort from conflict, comfort from con uh, affliction. Comfort in affliction, that sounds like an oxymoron. You know, an oxymoron is an expression <clears throat> with apparently contradicting terms, comfort and affliction. That sounds contradictory, doesn't it? But the verses 1 to 11 is about the Apostle Paul's ministry, his, his ministry and mainly his physical afflictions and sufferings and how he endured them all with the comfort granted to him by the grace of God. There's nobody else in the New Testament besides Jesus who suffered more. And, and that person is Paul. So the point is this. It is true afflictions and sufferings, whether it was Paul's or whether it's our own, true afflictions and sufferings, God taught Paul to rely on him. The God of comfort. God intends also to teach us the same lesson through our afflictions. God wants us to rely on him as we journey through this life that is filled with struggles and afflictions. So let me remind you at this juncture, remind you of Jesus' invitation. Did not Jesus invite us? His, 
And I quote from the New Living Translation, Matthew 11, 28. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. This is Jesus' invitation to us. Come to me, all you who are weary and uh, carry heavy loads. You know, weary and heavy loads is a very, very appropriate way to describe the state of men and women on the earth in today's hurried society more than ever. We are all very weary and we are all heavy laden. <coughs> The Savior beckons us to stop and look to Him for rest. <clears throat> you know, the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, he says, this is what he tells the, the, the people of Judah. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, only in returning to me and resting in me, will you be safe. In quietness and confidence is your strength, but you would have none of it. So God passed this judgment on his people in the Old Testament. In me, by resting in me, by coming and returning back to me, you will be safe. In quietness and confidence is your strength, but you would have none of it you would have none of it. So most men and women would have none of it. Even some Christians today, I would hazard a guess, most of the time we choose to rely on ourselves. It's unfortunate, but it's natural. Most of the time, we just choose to rely on ourselves. We have to put our minds and hearts into learning. Yes, we need to learn. Learn to rely on God and not ourselves. Because true rest and comfort can only be found in Him. True rest and comfort is only available in God. However, in the passage we read just a little while ago, Paul's afflictions were non-physical. Chapter 1, to uh, verses 1 to 11 describes he hinted at his physical afflictions, but in the passage that we have read, <coughs> he hinted that his uh, <coughs> afflictions are non-physical. They were emotional afflictions that came from falsehood and misunderstanding. And can he still rely on God for comfort? You bet he can. And we too have a lot of suffering and afflictions that are non-physical. So, the theme that I want to explore with you today is the Apostle Paul was falsely and maliciously accused of being insincere by a few. I believe only a small group of his enemies who have infiltrated and influenced the church in Corinth. So they were accusing him of being insincere, uh, flip-flopping between yes and no, etc. Don't forget, it was a church. It was a church that Paul founded, taught and pastored in and was a church he loved greatly. But now, his enemies and the enemies of the gospel stir up trouble for him. He was falsely accused of being unreliable and inconsistent. When he was accused, how did he respond? How did he respond? As we look into this issue today, I believe the Bible, the Bible will teach us how we should respond when we ourselves are wrongly accused of being inconsistent or unreliable or simply being accused of doing things we did not do, or the opposite, doing things we shouldn't be doing. I'm sure a lot of us have experienced this. All this will cause mental anguish and internal affliction. So we're going to explore uh, this issue by asking ourselves three questions. Three questions. 
One, how should you respond when you are falsely accused? Question number two, does the Bible teach us how we should respond uh, to false accusations? And three, how would you apply principles taught in the Bible about this issue? Well, first, let's look at question number one. How should you respond when you are falsely accused? Let's first look at a problem we fall into very easily, being misunderstood. Everybody here, I'm sure, at one time or other, even now, uh, felt that he or she has been misunderstood by someone, by our spouses, by our children, by our friends, etc. So, let me ask you, right now, are you, are you at peace with everyone? Are you at peace with everyone? You know, most of us have some conflict with someone, somewhere, all the time, don't we? We always have some conflict with someone, somewhere, all the time. We feel that they have already judged us, questioned our motives and integrity. This happens a lot in a, in a work a place where you have to work with a lot of uh, peers and colleagues, etc. And, <clears throat> and sometimes, sometimes they do something bad. They will let others know about it and put us in a bad light whether it is fact-based or non-fact-based, they will put us in a bad light. So Paul struggled with this. But what makes it tough and difficult was that the problem was within the church itself. The problem was generated in the church and the church, it remained in the church. So Paul wrote in the early chapters to try to fix the problem. Before he, states the, before he states the problem, he reveals his approach to handling this conflict. You look at verse 12, first part of verse 12, he says, we can say, he says here very firmly, very openly and very honestly, we can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness. So Paul's approach is first, he searches his conscience. He shall search his conscience. Conscience. He first looks within himself. He doesn't look at others. This may sound triad and simple, but ponder over it for a moment. It is not our nature. Our nature is marred with sin. We, we easily ignore this truth how badly sin has deformed our character. The, ref, the reformers calls this condition total depravity. So, the, <clears throat> so we have been badly deformed by, by uh, uh, sin, and then we do not take the time, or do, neither do we have the inclination to look within ourselves, to look into our own conscience, to see whether we ourselves are clear with God before we jump to any conclusions. We have the natural tendency to always blame others and always believe we are right. Any of your experience this? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, I'm the first one to raise my hands. So we, <clears throat> you know, so we have this uh, tendency to always blame others. This blame culture started in the Garden of Eden. If Blame the snake, this, I mean, and then uh, blame Adam, and, and God blame, uh, I mean, Adam blame God, and so on. So this blame culture is with us since the, the fall of man. The Bible shows us that the right thing to do is what Paul did here. He first looked within himself. He first looked within himself. Instead of being defensive, he clears himself before God first. Very important principle to learn. So I recommend, I recommend three questions to you to ask yourself when you feel misunderstood. Three questions I would recommend to you when you feel misunderstood or you feel wrong. <clears throat> Examine yourself before God to make sure that you are not in the wrong in the first place. 
First question, is there anything about the misunderstanding that God would not approve of? So when you look within yourself, you examine your conscience, so ask yourself, is there anything about that misunderstanding, and you have to be honest with yourself, that God would not approve of? So you examine yourself. Question number two, have I done anything wrong? And third and last question, does your conscience bother you about any part of the misunderstanding? Does it bother you about any part of the understanding? So friends, let me reiterate. It takes spiritual maturity, really spiritual matur maturity and humility to do this kind of self-examination. But most of the time, my experience is people live in a state of denial. So it takes spiritual maturity uh, and humility to, this, to just self-examine. So let me share the observations uh, that, were, uh, that came from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think some of you know who he is. Dr. Martin Luther uh, King, he names himself after Martin Luther, uh, but Martin Luther King was the late uh, American civil rights uh, leader. His three observations are this. He says, cowardice. Cowardice means you are fearful of, uh, of being uh, the truth. Cowardice ask the question, is it safe? Is it safe? Conscience, a uh, con consensus seeks the question, is it popular? Is it popular? Conscience ask, is it right? Is it right? So examine yourself, is it right? Listen again, listen again to what Paul says. He says, we can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness. We have lived with a God-given holiness. Paul is talking about a conscience that is shaped by God and informed by God's word. It is shaped by God and it is shaped by uh, and informed by God's word. Some people have clear conscience. Now, listen to this. Some people have clear conscience even when their actions are evil. Uh, evil here simply means an absence of good. So there are people who have clear conscience when their actions are evil. Some people have clear conscience even when their actions are void of goodness because their conscience is so warped by sin that they cannot see it or they deny it. Just, just don't bother. So uh, <clears throat> that is total depravity for you. So the first principle in Paul's approach to handling false accusations and misunderstanding is this. Clear your conscience. Clear your conscience. Okay. After you check on your conscience, you need next to ensure that you are open and above board. So clear your conscience, then you yourself examine to see that you are really open and above board. Look at uh, uh, the verse, the whole of verse uh, 12 again. I'll read it to you. We can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given uh, holiness and sincerity in all our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. So this is how we have conducted ourselves before the world and especially toward you. So here, Paul simply states that he operates by godly principles. He operates by godly principles. Can we say that we always, can we say that we always operate with God, godly principles all the time? Can we say that? I don't know. Only we can answer our question. So, he rejects, Paul rejects worldly attitudes when he says he does not operate by human wisdom. He is not manipulative, but he is open. He is completely open. Verse 13, he says, Our letters have been straightforward and 
<coughs> and there is nothing written written between the lines. <coughs> I believe here he may be replying to a specific issue that the false teachers in Corinthians are accusing him of. Uh, they said his writings are difficult to understand, he is weak, uh, uh, he only appears strong, and then we have to read in between the lines, he hints at a lot of other things. So they're making all these false accusations of him. But he says here, we have been very straightforward, there is nothing written between the lines, and nothing you cannot understand. So I hope someday you will fully understand us. Paul does not try to conceal his motives. He's open, he's above board, and he has no ulterior agenda or motives uh, to conceal. He hopes that they will come around uh, to recognize this. That's what he, uh, his anguish, heartfelt expression is in this letter. <coughs> now, let's go look at the second question. Does the Bible, does the Bible teach us how we should respond to false accusations? No, misunderstand, misunderstanding can lie hidden in the heart. It is not good. It's really not good to leave it there unsettled. It will usually and unexpectedly burst out. And it will usually burst out time and time again. You know, so it is not good to let it uh, settle in the heart. If you are upset about something, or you feel someone is upset at you, then you have to do something about it. Yes, you have to do something about it. I want to acquaint you with uh, what Jesus taught on this issue. Let me read to you Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Just two verses from Matthew chapter 5. And if I mention Matthew chapter 5, you know it is a teaching taken from uh, his uh, Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Verse 23, Matthew 5, he says, So, he says, So, he's talking to his disciples, So, if you are presenting a sacrifice, or uh, the Greek word translated sacrifice here can also mean a gift. So, if you are presenting a sacrifice, a gift at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. You're on your way to the temple to present a gift to God, okay? And then suddenly you remember that someone else has something against you. Uh, leave, leave your gift or uh, sac sacrifice at the altar. Don't present it to God yet. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer uh, your sacrifice to God. The implications of this teaching is very uh, uh, strict to me. That means if you feel that somebody has something against you and you bring a gift to God, what Jesus is saying, God may not accept it unless you settle that issue first. So, so the implications here is quite uh, 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 profound. So I want you to note that here, Jesus expects you Yes, you. Jesus expects you to take the initiative. You may be the offender, he may be the offender, uh, you may be the off offended party, the other person may be the offending party, but Jesus uh, makes no distinction about that. He wants you to take the initiative. He expects you to take the initiative. When we neglect to settle misunderstandings or conflicts. The results will be, there will be strife, schism, division, hurt and pain in the church and maybe in the family and in every human enterprise. This is how important this principle is for us to take note of. Because if we do not settle it there and then, then it festers in the heart and it will again and again, repetitively causes trouble. So, <clears throat> uh, settle the misunderstanding of conflict 
immediately before you even come to God. Jesus expects that because if not, then the strife, the schism, the division, the hurt and pain will remain in the church, in the family or in every human enterprise. I want now to take a few moments to share with you what happened to cause the misunderstanding between Paul and the Corinth church, which led his enemies to accuse him of being unreliable and inconsistent. So here's the background to the problem. You, uh, let me read to you, uh, or if you like, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 15 and 16. He says, Since I was so sure of your understanding and trust, I wanted to give you a double blessing by wishing you, by visiting you twice. First on my way to Macedonia, and again when I return from Macedonia. Then you can send me on my way to Judea. This was Paul's plan A. This was his plan A. Travel, travel from uh, Ephesus, because by this time he was writing, he was already in Ephesus, he has left Corinth. Travel from Ephesus to Corinth, work out problems in a church, travel through Greece, uh, it, uh, and then return to Corinth. This will mean a double blessing. That means he, his plan A was to visit Corinth twice on his uh, traveling journeys. And then there will be a double blessing, bless them while he's coming and bless them while they are going. Now look at what Paul wrote in his first letter, 1 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 to 9. Let me read it to you. He says, I am coming to visit you after I've been to Macedonia, for I'm planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter, and then you can send me on my way uh, to my next destination. This time, I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while, if the Lord will let me. In the meantime, I will be <clears throat> staying here in Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. Uh, there is a wide open door for a great work here, uh, although many oppose me. This was Paul's plan B. So he had a plan A and then he had a plan B about visiting the church that he loved uh, <clears throat> on his uh, missionary journeys. But at last, all this did not happen. All this did not happen according to plan. And the Corinth church was upset and felt offended. It is not the church, it is the troublemakers that were stirring up. So these this plans did not happen and they were upset and, and uh, he was being accused of being unreliable and inconsistent, etc. This seems, you know, this seems in our modern context, this seems like a small issue, right? But Paul had a group of people in Corinth who opposed him and his ministry. And they used this to stir up the church and accuse Paul of being unreliable and inconsistent and behaving like a, a pagan. Now, Paul didn't want this issue to rest, though it um, appeared to be very... Uh, just a normal issue, but it is not. Because if they succeed, if they succeed in accusing him of being inconsistent and reliable, then the gospel that he represents and the gospel that he preaches may also be tainted with the same brush of inconsistency and unreliability. That's why Paul had to respond to this. So, so but please note, the Christians there chose to ignore what Paul said in writing. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7, he says, If the Lord will let me. If the Lord will let me. <clears throat> you know, this phrase in uh, uh, Arabic is inshallah. And I tell you, I have a I lived in the Middle East for 
several years, and this this phrase "Inshallah" really annoys me beyond measure. <laughs> really nice. So we have a lot of uh, um, I won't I won't use the term lazy. Or, or we have a lot of uh, uh, Arabic uh, Palestinian uh, uh, people working in my organization and all that. And then they will ask permission from the, their manager uh, that they want to go back to their village or whatever, etc. Et and all that. And they'll find the least excuse and they'll return to their village. And then after <coughs> the days that they have been approved for leave, they don't return. They don't come back. And then in the meantime, <laughs> you have work that's left undone. So I asked the manager, he says, boss, inshallah, he didn't come back. <laughs> inshallah. So this annoys me. So Paul fell into the same situation. The, 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 his enemies there used this as an excuse to attack him. And then when they can discredit him uh, himself, then the gospel he represents may be discredited also. So, and then he says, uh, he says that if God willing, so he has made the plans, but he submitted to God. And then he says in verse 9, there is a wide open door for a great work here. So circumstances has changed. He was in uh, Ephesus. The God opened great door for him to do more work there. So uh, since it is God opening the door for him, he stayed behind. Uh, and uh, carry on with his uh, evangelistic work. Uh, so therefore, his plan changes. So the, in the days where it is hard to communicate, you don't have a, a email, you don't have a WhatsApp messages or whatever, uh, the people didn't know why his plans were changed. So the enemies took advantage of that. So Paul's uh, change of plan is because God opened a wide door for more missionary work in Ephesus. That's why he stayed behind. That's why he did not go. So he had to stay back to take advantage of that. So this tells us, this tells us a very important principle. Paul chooses, Paul chooses to work according to God's leading. He chooses to work according to God's leading, not according to worldly wisdom. Yes, he has uh, written to them saying that he will visit, but circumstances change. God changed the circumstances, so he was submissive enough to work according to God's leading and not according to worldly wisdom. So now let us consider last question. How would you apply principles taught in the Bible? How would you apply principles taught in the Bible? I think it will suffice to summarize what we have covered earlier. See? First, search and rely on your conscience to see if you are in the clear and that God has nothing to disapprove of. To make sure that you are open and above board. That is basic honesty. <clears throat> Thirdly, if there's really a misunderstanding or conflict, take the initiative Take the initiative to settle it. Don't let it fester. Let me close with an illustration from Socrates' life. Socrates was the founder of Western philosophy. He is the first uh, uh, Western moral philosophy of the ethical uh, uh, tradition. He lived, of course, before Jesus' time. Um, but I think from his uh, philosophy and all that, uh, I think he believes in God. He's not an atheist. So let me illustrate this from uh, uh, an incident from his life. You know, one day, <coughs> one of his acquaintance uh, came to him. This is Socrates, uh, who lived about three, four, five hundred years before Christ. Uh, <coughs> uh, and the first uh, Western uh, philosopher, moral philosopher, uh, in Athens, one day one of his acquaintance came to him to say that he had something to tell Socrates about one of his students. Socrates stopped him 
and said that he first had to pass through three filters. Three filters before you say what you want to say to me. Number one, he says, have you made absolutely sure what you are going to tell me is true? Did you see it yourself? Did you hear it yourself? Were you there to experience yourself? So are you absolutely sure that what you're going to tell me is true? The acquaintance says, well, actually, no, I just heard it. Then Socrates says, there's a second filter. Socrates asks him, what you are going to tell me, is it good or bad? Is it good or bad? The acquaintance says, well, it is bad. Then Socrates says, you have one more filter to go through before you, you, tell me the, you tell me about it. What you're going to tell me, is it, it what Socrates says, you are, what you're going to tell me is not good and you're not sure it is true, but you still have one more filter to go. Uh, <clears throat> what you're going to uh, tell me, uh, will it be useful for me? Will it be useful for me? The man said that he do not think so. Then Socrates says, what you are going to say is not true, it is not good and not useful to me. So please, don't tell me. Please don't tell me. You know, this is sound humanistic philosophy. Is it true? Is it good? Is it useful? If the answers are no, then don't say it. Don't repeat it. Don't say it. But Jesus' divine teachings in the Sermon of the Mount, in the Sermon of the Mount, is this: Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything uh, that is beyond this comes from the evil, the evil one. Come, let us bow in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the wisdom that comes from your word. We know that the devil has put blinkers in our eyes. He has put, he has hardened our hearts and stopped our ears to your wisdom. But we pray, O oh Father, that today you will grant us the spirit and the resolve to attend to your word and to attend to your word humbly, submissively, so that we can low, know, we can grow in Christ and grow in love for one another. Here yeah, is our prayer, for we pray and ask with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>